Welcome to our Good Friday service. God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down they kept watch over him there. Above his head they placed the written charge against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross. If you are the son of God, in the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and off it, offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. There is one question that is as old as suffering itself, to put it in a word, why? Simply to say that it is the human lot to suffer is to give an answer as simplistic as it is unsatisfactory. There have been many theories to explain suffering. They may have satisfied intellectuals, but have been incomprehensible to ordinary people who have to try to relate to suffering, their own or others, without confusion or bitterness. Christ was indeed truly human, and so he had to relate 
not only to his physical suffering, but also to the injustice of it all. He was to be condemned by Pilate for a crime he had not committed and for a blasphemy of which he was incapable. He was to be mocked for being what he knew himself to be, a king, the king of the Jews. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was confronted by the certainty of what was so soon to become a reality. He knew the suffering that lay ahead of him. He turned to his friends for support, but where were they? One was to betray him, and the rest, sleeping now, was soon to desert him. Bitterness could so easily have been his response to them, but it was not. He spoke to them with compassion. His calmness is a quality that seems so often to elude us when we suffer, especially if our suffering seems unfair. If we know our sufferings to be the fruits of wrong we have done, perhaps it is possible to accept them as just and reasonable. But when we have to suffer apparently without cause, for no wrong committed, how hard we find it to accept without confusion and bitterness. What was the secret of Jesus' peace? He had given the answer to his disciples when he taught them to pray. When you pray, he told them, say, Our Father, thy will be done. In the Garden of Gethsemane, this was his prayer. Not my will, but yours be done. That was the secret of his inner peace. If his father could allow what the world would see as utter injustice and evil, then it had to be that, in this way, the father could accomplish an even greater good, the reconciliation of humanity with its creator and its God. The injustice of the human condemnation had to be destroyed by a divine and compassionate judgment, one that would reconcile justice with love. Lord Jesus, when suffering enters our lives, help us to say, Father, thy will be done, and so come to share in your peace.
We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. There is no gospel record of Jesus meeting Mary on his way to the cross. But love would surely have demanded it, and tradition has always held that they did meet. When two people truly love each other, their love makes each vulnerable to the suffering of the other. The greater the love, the greater the vulnerability. There are times when word cannot communicate what we feel, and surely the time when this mother and this son met must have been one such moment. Words cannot communicate the depth of feeling and shared suffering, but silence could. A glance, a touch, yes, these would have been exchanged, and in the exchange, both were healed and strengthened. Both the mother and the son would have been encouraged to remain true to the will of the father, a will accepted in love, if not understanding. There are times in the lives of each one of us when we have to share the sufferings of those we hold dearest, how do we help to heal, to strengthen? It can be only too easy to try to use words, but do we use them to protect ourselves from what silence might reveal? Our own fear and inadequacy? Silence can supply what words cannot give, not an answer to the question of suffering, but rather the support of love. If, in times of suffering, 
God is to be enc encountered as the God of love. It has to be through love communicated rather than through reason verbalised. Mary could not have given her son any knowledge he did not already have, but she could and would have given him love, a love that would sustain them both in their shared suffering. We live in a world of pain and suffering, and all too often we have no idea how to help. When suffering enters the lives of those we love, love itself has to become the greatest strength. Nothing else is great enough or strong enough to sustain those who suffer. Lord Jesus, when those we love have to suffer, may Mary's loving example sustain both us and those we love as it sustained you. Amen.
We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. To be confronted by Christianity is to be confronted by a paradox. Things are not what they seem. Never was this more true than for the onlookers that day in Jerusalem, when they saw yet another criminal stumble and fall under the weight of the cross. The man looked no worse, but assuredly no better than the other criminals who had passed that morning. None would have perceived that he was to rise from the dead, to be worshipped by ages yet to come. No, they would have judged by appearances. Had we been there, would we, in fact, have reacted any differently? It would be nice, reassuring, to believe that we would have, but would that be the truth? No, if we are to be honest, few of us would have been any different. When we see a bedraggled man lying in a gutter, what is our first thought? He must be drunk. If, on the other hand, we see a respectably dressed man fallen, how do we respond? Has he had a heart attack? No, we are seldom objective in our judgment of others. All too often, we judge merely by appearances. Sadly, the media have conditioned us to judge others through their eyes. How often do we hear people say, it must be true, I read it in the papers, I saw it on television. Yet the judgments of the media are far from impartial. You can read an account of an event in two papers of different persuasions and find it hard to believe that they are describing the same event or person. Somehow or other, we must strive to be objective in our judgments, to have minds open enough to see that things may not be as they seem to be on the surface. In our own lives, we expect understanding and consideration from other people. We can be profoundly hurt if people judge us merely by our appearance. We should strive to be as generous to others. Christ was judged superficially, but how wrong were those who judged him? Lord Jesus, help us to avoid judging other people by mere appearances but rather help us to see others through your eyes and to love them with your love. Stricken, smitten and afflicted, see him dying on the tree tis the Christ by man rejected yes my soul tis he tis he tis the long expected prophet David's son yet David's Lord by his son God now has spoken, tis the true and faithful word. Tell me ye who hear him groan, was there ever grief like his? Friends through fear, his cause disown. Foes insulting his distress. Many hands were raised to wound him, none would interpose to save. But the 
deepest stroke that pierced him was the stroke that justice gave. Suppose the evil great here may view its nature rightly, here its guilt may estimate. Mark the sacrifice appointed, see who bears the awful load. Tis the adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Only a mother could possibly know the feelings of Mary as the dead body of Jesus, her son, was lowered into her arms. Who could put those feelings into words? Surely not even Mary herself could adequately have expressed the flood of emotion that she must have felt. With what love she would have received that lifeless body. Her thoughts must have reached back in time to those other times when she shared with him a gentle embrace of love. When she first held the word of God in her arms, her feelings of wonder must have been beyond words. She handed the baby to Joseph, the shepherds, the magi, so that they too could know the warmth of his tender and loving embrace. When she handed Jesus to Simeon, he received him with loving wonder and prophesied over the child and the mother. A sword of sorrow would pierce her heart, a heart then filled with love. Now, in this final embrace, that prophecy was fulfilled, and how totally. Mary understood that Jesus had fulfilled the Father's will in its entirety. All the prophecies concerning him had been fulfilled to perfection. As Jesus had grown in wisdom and knowledge before God and man, she too had grown, but now 
what was left of that wisdom, that knowledge and that love. In purely human terms, Mary's heart must have been broken, pierced. But these cannot have been her only feelings. Her faith in and love of the Father and her Son meant that she would always remain filled with the spirit of their love. At the time of the Annunciation, she was filled with the Holy Spirit and that spirit of love would never be taken from her. At the Last Supper, Jesus had given his peace to his disciples, but preeminently he must have given it to his mother. This peace would have enveloped her as she looked on, on the once agonised body of her son, now at peace. May that same spirit ever give those who mourn a share in Mary's faith which enabled her to accept the Father's will with love, if not with comprehension. Lord Jesus, may the spirit of your love ever sustain the bereaved and ease the pain of parting, replacing it with your own peace. Amen. Uh, let us pray. The response to, O crucified Christ, have mercy on your sisters and brothers is, O God of the cross, deliver us from evil. We seek your saving grace, God of Christ Jesus, for all those who on this Good Friday are lost among their doubts, sins, griefs, or fears. O crucified Christ, have mercy on your sisters and brothers. O God of the cross, deliver us from all evil. For those who suffer gravely from the cruel abuse of their fellows and all who suffer because of the apathy and neglect of respectable people. O crucified Christ, have mercy on your sisters and brothers. O God of the cross, deliver us from all evil. For some who are suffering from disease or accident, and the many who suffer because of terrorism and war. O crucified Christ, have mercy on your sisters and brothers. O God of the cross, deliver us from all evil. For people who bear their suffering alone and unaided, and others who, though surrounded by medical personnel and equipment, still find pain unbearable. O crucified Christ, have mercy on your sisters and brothers. O God of the cross, deliver us from all evil. For those who suffer abuse at home or at work, and the many children who suffer from the bullying or rejection of their peers. O crucified Christ, have mercy on your sisters and brothers. O God of the cross, deliver us from all evil. For any who suffer a painful terminal illness and loved ones whose spirit are this day torn by raw grief, O crucified Christ, have mercy on your sisters and brothers. O God of the cross, deliver us from all evil. For those who in their suffering have no faith to support them and whose once vibrant faith seems to be ebbing away under stress, O crucified Christ, have mercy on your sisters and brothers. O God of the cross, deliver us from all evil. For all who in suffering still trust and praise their God, and those who while suffering themselves still give comfort to the distressed friends and loved ones. O crucified Christ, have mercy on your sisters and brothers. O God of the cross, deliver us from all evil. Loving God, we commit our lives into your hands, that in sickness or in health, in joy or in sorrow, we may carry, without grumbling, whatever cross you give us, and always have time and love for those who are falling down under the weight of their hardship. This we ask through Christ Jesus, our Redeemer. Amen. 
we have a special coronavirus prayer. Lord God, we entrust to you the families and communities affected by coronavirus, wherever they may be. We, have, we pray especially for the healthcare workers that you may guide and protect them. We give thanks for the invention and speedy deliverance of the vaccine. We pray that your spirit might inspire those researching new medicines and treatments. And in the midst of this, keep us strong in faith, hope and love. Grant us the courage and perseverance to be good neighbours. May the words of your Son, Jesus Christ, in our Father, be our prayer, as we entrust ourselves and all of us who are affected to your infinite power and love. Amen. Let us pray for the coming of God's kingdom in the words our Saviour taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son Jesus Christ delivered and saved mankind, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. 